Thank you, Ronnie. Mm -hmm. but, uh, I didn't recognize you. <laughs> hey, uh, it was a crowded room. It was a, it was, it was a crowded bar, which um, you know has its ups and downs as a site for the reading. Um, I, I had a microphone about like this, and I, I think probably past about the third row, you would have been totally unable to hear me. But uh, but Sam uh, Sam read while holding the mic like this, which I thought was very <laughs> rock and roll. And I've kind of wanted to do it ever since, but I've never really had the opportunity. Um, the Privileges is a, a, a novel that covers about 20 years in the lives of a family called the Morris. Uh, they live right here in New York. They, uh, uh, the husband and wife, whose names are Adam and Cynthia, they don't really come from money, but by the time everything is said and done, they're pretty much awash in money. And uh, they have two children named uh, April and Jonas. And uh, by the time the book's done, April is in her 20s and in all kinds of um, adult trouble. But I'm just going to read a short scene tonight, which is one of April's first appearances in uh, the narrative, at which, point, at which point she's in first grade. At school, April's first task was to esteem herself. They began with self-portraits, huge-headed, in which the bodies were an afterthought a portion of roughly the same space on the page as a nose or an ear. The portraits smiled widely with crooked teeth, not because the children's teeth were crooked, but because teeth were hard to draw. They made lists of the reasons they liked themselves, lists of the things they were good at and the things at which they were determined to improve. They named the comforts of their homes, pets, siblings, favorite toys or favorite places. One girl said her favorite place was Paris, but April took this to mean the imaginary Paris of the Madeline books. Her own favorite place was her parents' bed, with her parents not in it, just her and a few stuffed animals and a juice box and a Disney movie on TV. She dreamed of this situation often, though in practice she usually had to be sick to attain it. Something told her, though, that it would be seen as babyish, and so she said the Central Park Carousel instead. Less auspicious was the name project. A name, the students were told, had a secret history. It might connect you to the country from which your family had first emigrated, or to the language or the religion of that country, or even just to the family itself and the loved ones who had gone before. It let you know that you were not just some one-time phenomenon, but an outcome, a culmination, the top branch of a majestic tree. Told to go home and conduct some research on why she was named April Mori, she saw her parents exchange a quick look before her mother answered. Well, Cynthia said, muting the TV, Dad and I talked about a lot of different names. We would sit on the couch in our old apartment and try them out on each other back when I was pregnant with you, say them out loud to see how they sounded. And there were a few we liked, but we kept coming back to April. April Mori. It just sounded the most beautiful to us. Her dad smiled and patted her mom's leg. That's it, April said. They looked as confused as she was. Also, her father said, sitting forward on the couch, it's a pretty unusual name. Not a lot of other Aprils in the world. We wanted a name as special as you are. They'd given her her name not because somebody else had had it, but because nobody had. Was there ever another April in our family, she asked. They looked at each other again and shook their heads. Why didn't you name me after a loved one? A loved one, Adam said. <laughs> April nodded. A dead loved one. That's what a lot of people do. Or somebody from the old country. Her mother punched her father in the thigh. And that, it shocked April to realize, was because he had been about to laugh. Where do we come from? She demanded of them. What country? Stunningly, they seemed less than sure. Adam knew his father's family had come from England, but he didn't know where in England specifically, nor how many generations ago that had been. His mother's family was part German and part Dutch. Cynthia knew her father's ancestors were Russian, unless he'd been lying about that too. And as for her maternal grandparents, her mother had always refused to discuss them. Was there something special about the month of April? April asked. There wasn't. No historic event had taken place then, no anniversary or birthday, though they did offer that if April's birthday had actually fallen in April, they would have named her something else. <laughs> what would you have named me instead, she persisted. The revelation that she, April, might just as plausibly have been Samantha or Josephine or Emma that only chance was behind the whole solemn question of her identity made her feel worse than ever. She could see that her parents were now upset, but she was angry at them and didn't care. They kept coming back to beauty, but it was a beauty she couldn't comprehend and that she wasn't at all sure her teacher would consider a satisfactory completion of the assignment. 
Ms. Diaz was nice about it, of course, but there was nothing to be done about the jealousy engendered by the other longer name essays that went up on the walls above their lockers, stories of honored relatives and cool languages and religious rituals tended through the generations. April felt as if her family came from nowhere, and more puzzlingly, that this suited her parents just fine. The next unit was family traditions. The teacher took pains to define this idea as broadly as possible. Still, what traditions did April's family have? They hardly ever did the same thing even twice. They had no ancestral home they returned to, no church they attended. Her mom had gone to church as a child, but April had heard her say that she hated it and was glad she never had to go again. No special place they liked to travel to. Indeed, having been someplace on vacation once, like Nantucket or Vail or Disney World, even if they'd had a good time there, was usually cited as a reason not to go there again. Even their Christmas tree wasn't in the same place, at the same spot every year. April knew her own grandparents so little that she sometimes mixed them up in her head and was shy about talking to them on the phone. She had one uncle and no aunts, just something her mother called a step-aunt, whom she'd only ever seen in a photo in her parents' wedding album. Soon the whole temper of the assignment had changed, in April's mind, from an exercise in self-discovery to an indiscriminate hunt for what Ms. Diaz, for whom she would have died in any case, wanted to admire in her. It seemed perfectly defensible to start making things up. She wrote down that her family went to St. Patrick's Cathedral every Sunday and that they were considering a trip to Jerusalem for Christmas. <laughs> her grandmother on her mother's side, who was named May, had lost her parents as a girl but had gamely made her way from Holland to America by boat. Every summer, April and her cousins gathered for a reunion at the family estate on a mountain in New Hampshire. It was so big that some of her distant pioneer relatives were buried in a small graveyard right there on the place. Adam and Cynthia read these notions on the wall beneath their daughter's self-portrait on parents' night, mute with amazement. April's teacher couldn't really believe this stuff, could she? Yet she had posted it right there with all the other handwritten, dubiously spelled histories of perseverance and hardship. They already felt conspicuous, as they always did at these school functions, as the youngest couple in the classroom. At 29, they were still strikingly young, by Manhattan standards at least, to be parents at all. Jonas's best friend in kindergarten had once slept over for a whole weekend while his father took his mother to London for her 50th birthday. Every parent's night, Adam and Cynthia were a kind of generation unto themselves, and it didn't take much, in that context, to awaken a vestigial unease about being in some sort of trouble they didn't even understand. When Ms. Diaz, deep in conversation with some kid's father who was surely old enough to be their father too, smiled at them from across the room as if to say that she would be with them in just a moment, they smiled back warmly until she turned away, and then Cynthia squeezed Adam's arm, and they got the hell out of there. <laughs> Thank you.